incredible challenges throughout. Like right out of the gate, you have to be executing these syncopated rhythms. Articulation is paramount. This harkens back to the pedagogy of Marcel Mule and, and his successor, Daniel Defayet, the great Paris Conservatory, where the, the elements of articulation become a central focus of much of this repertoire. And I've always found that, that sound that, that was promoted by Mule, Defaye, and even Jean Milandex to be just such a crucial part of the culture of articulation. In modern times, we've seen articulation, or at least the severity and the depth of that staccato, for many players, often gets a little bit neutralized. They've moved more to maybe a more of a leggero approach or something much more connected. But I love the density of that old French articulation. <laughs> And I actually find that really crucial to just executing the volume of those notes and to help improve the accuracy or the percentage of time so that you'll, that you'll hit those notes. Um, the other elements of the piece, just making sure that you don't pull off the ties too soon, that you really can... Uh, sustain the rhythms into the tie without cutting the tie early. There's so many little details about the e-bear that I find it challenging for students and professionals alike. I've had amazing graduate students where the e-bear is a, a benchmark piece for them because it really, really just shows whether or not you, can un you understand rhythm and subdivision and articulation. The biggest challenge would be the optional altissimo pas passages, which now at this point in our profession, we're going to say that any altissimo passages are going to be mandatory because they were crucial to Ebert's original vision. Whereas early on, there were many performers that took those extended passages down, such as the one that ends this excerpt I performed for you. And that creates challenges because we're having to make choices about at what point we will switch over to a different register of the instrument, so to speak. Oftentimes we move from palm keys to the, the front alternate fingerings. And in my case, I like to move to the system of altissimo promoted by the great Eugene Rousseau in his book, High Tones for the Saxophone, in which he incorporates a system of fingerings that we affectionately call the, the triangle altissimo anchor. Where, where we're employing on the right hand, fourth finger, TC, and TA. This sets the right hand and creates a bit of resonance and venting to the right of the instrument. And it allows me to firmly place the natural overtones that are coming off of the left hand of the instrument. An altissimo A functionally is going to be second finger and third finger. When we isolate that note alone as its fundamental, it's not a very usable fundamental. Basically, it's a quarter tone. Its first overtone is an out-of-tune octave. And then its second overtone is actually the usable pitch on that fingering. So then we would further refine that fingering by adding the bent octave mechanism and then employing this right-hand triangle strategy that, that Rousseau and many of his students have employed in their teaching for decades, and it further refines that altissimo A. So then it's a chance to switch over to that system when I go from F-sharp, very classic old-school F-sharp, X2 and TA, crossing over to the G-sharp of the triangle system, one, two, three, triangle, 
then lifting one for A. This is usually the, the choice that defines the player on the e-bear. Some people will just miss that. And, or they have a fingering that's really close for one reason, but the bridge is the problem. So I bridge starting from side E to front F. This is the most effective bridge for me in making that passage reliable. Happy practicing. The e-bear is one of our great chestnuts.